John, thank you very much once again for joining us here on KTN News. My name is Akisander. I'm just about to get into an interview with Lord Ahmed of Wimbledon. He is the British Minister of State for Commonwealth and the United Nations, as well as British Prime Minister's Special Envoy on Preventing Sexual Violence and Conflict. And today we're looking at an array of issues that is just about to address, one of them being the Blue Economy Conference that is being held here in Kenya. We'll also be taking a look at efforts that are being made in preventing sexual violence across the globe as well as the state of the commonwealth and some of the challenges that are being experienced currently thank you very much My pleasure. for joining us for this conversation it's a pleasure to have you here thank you we can just start with the blue economy mm -hmm. quite an exciting um phenomenon now that ocean um countries or nations are coming together mm -hmm. and realizing that there's a lot of value in the ocean and they need to be spearheading this conversation. What are some of the big lessons you've picked from the conference? Well, first of all, I uh, congratulate the Kenyan government for actually hosting this conference. And I think it's entirely appropriate. It's in Africa. I mean, in your question, you also have part of the answer, the importance of the oceans mm -hmm. themselves. This isn't something which is sort of divided or differentiated between because you're one country in the west or the east, north or the south. This is something that impacts and involves us all. And therefore, it's entirely appropriate that we have collective and collaborative action. Now, some of the specifics in terms of the learnings, it's a continuing uh, continuation of the conference in London uh, during the heads of government meeting in London of the Commonwealth. There were key decisions made on First steps, let's clean up our oceans. Let's rid ourselves of the scourge of plastic in our oceans. And in that regard, again, if you look at the example of Kenya, I was a bit worried, I must admit, when I was coming here on the mm -hmm. plane, learning about the uh, strength of the plastic bag ban. Mm -hmm. And I was a bit perplexed as to what constituted a <coughs> plastic bag in, in terms of its application. But I think that action and direct action changes behavior. And people often think, hesitate from, should we sort of impact something or change something immediately. And actually, the example of Kenya demonstrably shows through that simple action, change happened. The same's happened in the UK. We've put charges on plastic bags. We've had efforts to reduce, you know, single-use plastics, yeah. uh, plastic straws are increasingly now being withdrawn from retail, uh, from fast food outlets. And I think it's a collective action. And you know, the action on plastics, which is part and parcel of what we've seen prioritized in this conference. Indeed, this morning I was hosting a breakfast of Commonwealth countries mm -hmm. as part of our commitment through the Commonwealth on what's called the Commonwealth Cl Clean Ocean Alliance, which we're spearheading with Vanuatu. It was all about simple steps we can take as countries, share good practice, mm -hmm. but importantly, you know, within your own household, sometimes it's said governments make these big yeah. policy decisions. What does it mean to me as an individual, even in my own house, because of you've got to sort of lead by example. You've got to affect that change in your own home. You know, my children are very young. I've got 13, 6 and 4 mm -hmm. is my lineup of the children. And the younger two are were pretty sort of firmly accustomed to using their plastic straws. Mm -hmm. Through instant change, they now know that those straws are reusable and we don't invest in plastic straws anymore. Now, that's one host household in the UK, but that's been replicated through many countries. But they're small examples of how we can clean up our oceans, because when you look towards the oceans, the plastic pollution is so severe. The fish we eat, for example, if they eat plastic, we're eating the fish. What does that mean? We're eating plastic. We're eating plastic. So those are those simple messages, and I think the conference has highlighted those, but also the concerted action that collectively we can take as countries. You know, if plastic is flowing in an ocean, and it flows from the Atlantic to the Pacific to the Indian and around the world, it won't be bound by mm. territorial mm. boundaries. And that's why it's important we come together as countries to act on it, and this conference underlines the importance of that. I'm glad you've mentioned the breakfast meeting with the Commonwealth states on uh, the blue economy, and you talk about some of the simple steps that we can take to ensure <coughs> sustainable um, uh, blue economy for all these countries. What are some of the... Um, what role can these Commonwealth states play in just ensuring that we sustain the blue economy if it came out? In well, first of all, what is the Commonwealth? I, you know, you and I are products yes. of the Commonwealth. It's a proud history, proud traditions, customs, cultures, communities, faiths all coming together. This incredible collection of 53 nations 
And let's not forget that, you know, there's a large percentage of the Commonwealth, 60% is under 30. And the issues of our planet, mm -hmm. issues of climate change, issues of cleaning up our oceans are relevant. Would you go to a person under 30? Mm -hmm. I have to admit I'm not one of those. Um, but if you go to a person under, these things matter to them. So it's entirely relevant that in the family that is the Commonwealth, we work together. Now, that doesn't mean that if you're a large developing, uh, developed state or you are a small island developing state, that somehow you're left on your own. That's the strength of the Commonwealth network. So for example, from a United Kingdom's perspective, not only are we making and affecting change within what we're doing in our own country, but today, for example, I announced an extra £10 million of funding for technical support to small island states. So I'm absolutely delighted that this particular initiative we're heading up with Vanuatu, a small Pacific island state mm -hmm. which may not have the expertise, the experience or the technical insights into what to do or indeed the resource to do it. But what the Commonwealth family provides mm -hmm. is both the uh, expertise, insight and indeed the finance to support that. And we also heard announcements from the likes of Canada and other countries. So this is about a partnership and a collective action of the Commonwealth 53, and that was reflected in the meeting this morning. How then do we ensure that uh, this conference that has been held is not just a talk shop? We know that among the Commonwealth we have what we call the Blue Charter. What do we expect to see in terms of impactful steps that are being taken in the next coming years to sustain our blue economy as a globe? Well, there's uh, several steps which you will say. We've already talked about the issues around plastics and cleaning up our oceans. We also need to invest in what are known as marine protection areas. And the United Kingdom's been uh, sort of at the cutting edge of that. I'm also amongst my different responsibilities, Minister for the Caribbean and Minister for the Overseas Territories, the British Overseas Territories. And we've actually invested in 4.3 uh, million kilometres of marine protected areas. Now what does that mean? It means these are areas protected in terms of ensuring sustainable fishing industries so all fishing stocks do not suddenly exhaust themselves. It's about ensuring protection of coral reefs which provide vital habitats to ensure that the natural habitat also can foster and grow because there are some startling statistics out there. If the ocean temperatures were to rise by two degrees, which may happen, mm -hmm. Well, actually, you, that's the end of coral reefs around the world. Now, it sounds rather alarming, but that's fact. What does that actually mean? We've seen climate change grip the world. We've seen hurricanes, for example, when Hurricane Maria and Irma hit in the Caribbean. Actually, these coral reefs help to protect. There's an, you know, in God's earth, these were natural protections to the earth and the land mass itself because they actually lower the actual height mm -hmm. of waves which are hitting coastlines. So we need, to, again, collective collaborative action to ensure that these changes are affected. So I think the real litmus test, and you're quite right to ask this, that when these conferences are held and grand pronouncements are made, the real action is on delivery. And I think we've set ourselves ambitious targets in the Commonwealth context in Kigali and Rwanda as the next Commonwealth conference. We want to ensure that the pledges that have been made, the technical support which has been promised, is actually landed. So whether you're a small island state or you're a developed state or you're anything in between, that through collective action we will see effective change. And I would say to you, I mean, I was speaking to one of the Kenyan ministers today, and he said, you know, sometimes there are mm -hmm. things that happen which perhaps we hadn't thought through as a positive. And from the plastic bag ban here, not only did it help the oceans and the rivers, the drainage system, the sewage system, he said, you know, we could look back 10 years from, you know, before now. Mm -hmm. And m many of the challenges they faced or you faced here in Kenya came from plastic bags being blocking up different systems, uh, uh, sewage systems and drainage systems here in Kenya. So there are some incredible impacts of making, as I said, small yet effective changes. And I think we are all, and the conference demonstrated that, committed to it, not just through national pledges, but collaborative international action. On the sidelines of this uh, conference, you've also sought to uh, address issues to do with uh, sexual violence, preventing sexual violence. What is your assessment as a special representative of the Prime Minister on sexual violence and conflict? What is your um, assessment of Africa's progress in terms of preventing sexual violence? Well, when you look at Africa, I think Africa serves an example to many of us across the globe. Gone are the days of this kind of things of the past. Africa is 
one of equal partnership. Our Prime Minister, Mrs May, when she was here in August, underlined that fact, that the commitment to Africa is not about one country giving and another country taking. Actually, those days are gone. These are about partnerships, partnerships on trade, partnerships on the economy. And we've seen conflict rage across Africa, but there's been other parts of the world that have also endured conflict, even in the current yeah. world we live in today. The Rohingya crisis in Burma appears on our screens on an almost daily basis. But the issue of sexual conflict is therefore a global one. What we've seen in Africa, we can see some positive stories. The story of Rwanda, for example, a country that was gripped by civil war. But you fast forward to 2018, I believe 64, 66 percent of Rwanda's parliament are now women. So it demonstrably shows that when you get, can sort of rebuild a country where women are at the heart and pivotal point of a country's progress, we need to make it happen. But on the issue of sexual violence and conflict, when I was first appointed to this role, I, I took it with great humility, but also with a sense of great responsibility. Firstly, there were some great initiatives mm -hmm. which had already been launched, one of my colleagues in the House of Lords, then Foreign Secretary William Hague, together with Angela Jolie, uh, launched an initiative almost five years ago on bringing the world's attention to sexual violence in conflict. It is totally and utterly wrong. It is as simple as that, where issues of violence against women, issues such as torture, where women's, the, the issue of rape, it's weaponized against women in particular, young girls, but also young boys as well. And women have had to endure the worst kind of example of that violence. Often, tragically, young girls, young women, young mothers are raped. They go through that ordeal. They show incredible courage to survive that ordeal. But what then happens is also heartbreaking, because they come back expecting support from their families, from their communities, their faith groups. And that what happens? They're rejected. They have to go through that ordeal. They're made to feel shame. They're made to feel as if they were the people who were at fault. We need to change all of that. And the investments we're making, the work we're doing across Africa and other parts of the world demonstrably are achieving that. One of the key priorities of my current agenda is to remove stigma, is to remove the whole concept that children born of such violent acts, children born of rape, are somehow to be held responsible for something. They are innocent in all of this. We need to ensure that not only countries take responsibilities, those who sometimes use culture wrongly, sometimes those people, as we saw with that despicable organization that was Daesh in places such as Syria and Iraq, who erroneously hijacked a noble faith to present their actions as some kind of noble cause. We need to challenge it. But it's not for governments to do it alone. It's not for NGOs to do it alone. It also requires a collective action, and that's where faith leaders have an important role to play. So I've been working very closely, for example, as a specific action mm -hmm. with faith leaders to actually use the basis of their own religious scriptures to show the total, utter rejection of such actions in place and demonstrate the vital role women have played historically within different faith traditions and, importantly, the respect that women should have within every society, including in the every faith group. And by changing and involving faith leaders, community leaders, actually you change the whole basis of how society views these incredible, courageous young women, and as I said, young men as well, who survive these ordeals ordeal, and of, often become the best advocates, as they term them, for what they've been through. But the tragedy still remains that when we look up conflicts of the past, we can still see today conflicts of the present. And therefore, it means that we can't take our foot off the accelerator. I've seen some incredible projects here mm -hmm. in Kenya when I visited an incredible center where there were girls, some of them who had suffered violence, uh, some who had suffered great sort of, you know, had suffered great sexual violence against them in some of the neighboring countries to Kenya, Congo being one such example, yeah. Somalia being another. But what did these young girls do when I pay tribute? to the work at the center, they'd actually not only got through that ordeal, they'd learnt languages, they'd learnt skills, and now they were empowered to actually make a difference for themselves, for their families and their communities. That is the strength of collective action on this initiative. And off camera, if I may say so, you said, what was the thing that moved me most? Mm -hmm. It was when I looked into those girls' eyes, I saw not only hope, but I saw great happiness 
I great, saw great ambition for their own future and the fact that they were grateful for what had happened to them, but they'd been given an opportunity to rebuild their lives, and they were doing exactly that. So that sort of brings to life the importance we often, as politicians, as policy makers, talk in the terms of resolutions and <clears throat> decisions we pass, policies we create. But when you see action on the ground, when you see that the efforts that are being put in internationally, the monies which are raised often to help education mm -hmm. and the acquirement of skills come to life, that makes this whole thing very worthwhile. It brings it to life. It brings it. It's real. Well, sexual abuse it continues to be used as a major weapon in, in, in conflict reading countries. Does it concern you uh, being a special representative in, in, in charge of this? Of course, absolutely. It's wrong. You know, when you look, we have conflicts. But even when you look, and as I said, you know, I talk of my own faith, if I may. You know, within Islam, there are those like organizations like Daesh who've used you know, these abuses, they, when they look at what was inflicted on the Yazidi mm -hmm. women in Iraq, they dehumanize them. When you talk to some of the Christians in Iraq, they said we were the lucky ones because we were given the choice either to leave or convert. The Yazidi women mm -hmm. didn't get that choice. Mm -hmm. But where is the sanction of that in any faith? Indeed, my own faith, when you go to the scriptures, there's a clear chapter which says in where conflict takes place, you protect the vulnerable, you protect the children, you protect the women, you protect the innocent, you protect the elderly, you protect places of worship. And you know what? It, chain, it talks about protecting churches and cloisters and synagogues before it talks about protecting mosques. So what does that say from that scripture? And Islam isn't unique to that. All religions, at their pristine purity, point to the fact that humanity is what should guide us. So those who use rape as a weapon of war, those who use violence against women as a weapon of war. We need to ensure that we collectively stand against that. We also need to ensure the raising of standards. So if there are NGOs operating in the field, I know a colleague of mine, the International Development Secretary, Penny Morden, has led the charge of ensuring that NGOs operating in the sphere also don't suddenly let their standards drop. Those who are going in to help people should show the best of standards. I'm Minister for the United Nations. Peacekeepers, when they go in to keep the peace and build the peace, they need to ensure the highest standards. So this is important that those who are there as peacekeepers and peacemakers also display the highest standards. And if they fall short, there should be serious repercussions for it. Finally, as uh, the Minister for a State for Commonwealth, I will not delve much into it, but there are jitters about the upcoming divorce with uh, the European Union in March next year. What assurance are you giving Commonwealth countries that the collaboration that has been there for years is still there and um, they should be looking forward to business collaborations? It's something that Theresa May, when she was touring the continent, uh, came to Kenya the other day, she insisted that Africa and uh, the UK will continue to collaborate, but the jitters are still there. What assurance are you giving as a Minister for Commonwealth? Well, first of all, you know, the Prime Minister talked of tariff-free, quota-free mm -hmm. trade, and that's the principle on, on which we continue to work with Africa and around the world. I think, first and foremost, when we talk of this, what is it? We had a referendum mm -hmm. in the United Kingdom. A referendum is giving the choice to people on an issue which was a motive, it was something that we knew was some different opinions existed uh, within our country. But it was important that to let people have a voice. They spoke, and they, by a majority, and that's a democracy at work, voted to leave the European Union. What the Prime Minister and her team, and I'm one of them, have sought to do over the last two years, or since the actual referendum, is ensure that this is orderly, that it's done in a manner which retains the strength of our partnerships with the European Union. You know, as the Prime Minister herself says, you know, we're leaving the European Union, we're not leaving Europe. We're not suddenly going to detach the United Kingdom and say, hello, Africa, can we join up with you? You know, geography, that won't happen. But that doesn't mean Africa doesn't matter or Asia doesn't matter. It does. What Brexit also allows us to do is strengthen our global relationships and free trade arrangements and partnerships with Africa. But we're doing it in an orderly fashion. Because if you're a business in the United, I was in the city, I was in business for 20 years. You want to plan 
ahead. You don't want assurance just for a month. You want to plan ahead for the next two years. And what the Prime Minister has negotiated is that as we leave the European Union, there is much that binds us together. We need to ensure our planes continue to fly, go goods continue to trade across the European Union. And that will continue to happen from the deal that has been secured, that access and reassurance has been given to businesses, not just in Britain, but also in the context of Africa and the trading relationships we have. We have given that commitment to ensure that Britain continues to have not only the current levels of trade, that we grow, for example, with Kenya beyond the 1.1 mm -hmm. billion that we have in trade, and there's great potential to do that. Now, as far as our European Union partners are concerned, they also recognize that. I have always said and retained that what you will see ultimately is pragmatism. And the deal we have in front of us ensures exactly that approach. There are concessions. Tell me one negotiation when you sit down. I mean, I've got children. I have to negotiate with them sometimes, you know, and I can assure you my starting point may be there, theirs may be there, and you meet. I hope somewhere nearer my side, they're probably hoping I meet nearer that side. I make a simple example, because that's what every negotiation involves. As they become more complex, and that when we come into negotiations in business, negotiations bilaterally, and negotiations in this case between a country that's been part of this uh, union for over 40 years, and suddenly you're trying to untangle yourself in terms of regulations, rules, laws, to ensure that what we have in the United Kingdom mm -hmm. is control of our borders, but at the same time protecting our vital relationships both within Europe, but also beyond Europe as well. And I believe after we've left the European Union next March that the future will be a bright one. Um, there are always jitters, to use the term you. I used to be in the city of London. You know, I worked in financial services. When the United Kingdom chose not to join the single currency. There were many people who said this is the end of the City of London, the United Kingdom will no longer be a centre for financial services, no people, no companies will invest in the UK. They were wrong. The euro wasn't the currency that people perceived. The United Kingdom's economy continued to grow. You know, we're the fifth largest economy in the world. That doesn't happen by accident. That means we've invested in our people, we've invested in services, we've invested in technical skills, and there's much we will continue to enjoy in terms of security collaboration, in terms of safety and aviation security with our European partners, and yes, trade as well. But we're at an important decision, an important crossroads. The Prime Minister has worked very hard and led from the front on this important relationship, and it's now over to my parliamentary colleagues. And I hope what emerges at the end of this process is something which is not only satisfactory but positive for the United Kingdom and for the European Union, but also within the context of the Commonwealth. The assurance I can g give you is this, that the Commonwealth matters. When you do trade with the Commonwealth, we trade on the basis of common laws. We trade on the basis of common languages, common systems, common education systems. Those things matter. Costs are lower by 19% when, you know, as a former businessman, I can assure you, if you had a contract based on the same legal systems and laws in the same language, you immediately lower your costs of doing business. Those are the things we value within the context of the Commonwealth and beyond. And I look forward to an independent, prosperous, global Britain, as we term it, which has a strong relationship with the European Union, but at the same time has strong relationships across the Commonwealth. And we look forward to strengthening our relationships right here in Kenya as well. Thank you very much for granting us this interview. My pleasure. A lovely conversation. That is Lord Ahmed of Umbledon, the British Minister of State for Commonwealth and the United Nations, as well as the special representative of the British Prime Minister for um, preventive, uh, preventing sexual violence, rather, and a conflict in that conversation um, surrounding some of the issues we have raised to the ocean economy. Uh, uh, preventing sexual violence and conflict and some of the efforts that are being made across the globe uh, to just ensure that there is sustainable economic growth, uh, human rights, conflict and other things. Thank you for joining us. My name is Akisa Andera. We'll see you later.